Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, so when Brother Tippett's called me, I saw that he called. I actually, like, thought I was in trouble. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> um, but then I thought, uh, when I called him back and I found out I was talking, I thought, it can't already be my turn. I Like, I swear I just talked. And then I realized it must be because I'm Church Hayes that first they were calling me for my last name Church and now we're on the Hayes part. <laughs> um, but yeah, like when I first came back to church, I, um, I couldn't remember any scriptures. Like I felt like because I had been, you know, a homeless meth addict and, um, you know, when I first came back to church, I couldn't remember any scriptures at all. And then I feel like I started reading them. Like I made a commitment to start reading them when I came back to church and I haven't been perfect at it. But when I was writing this talk and going through this talk, all these scriptures kept popping up and I was like, wow, you know, I still had to look them up and find out which ones they were, but I couldn't believe how many were coming into my mind. And I started realizing that maybe I am kind of getting good at, you know, learning the scriptures and um, recognizing them again. So, I guess, like, my heart's been really softened today um, because I was doing the worldwide fast for Ukraine. Um, and there was also a situation at a young lady in our church's school I was giving her a ride home and she told me that they had had a hard lockdown because there was two men in their school um, that were possibly armed and one was definitely armed and um, that it had been really, really scary and nobody was hurt, but it just made me realize how much the world needs these lessons. Um, so my talk is on the greatest possession and um, so um, I'm just going to share the scripture that kind of starts the talk out. Um, and it is Mark 10, 17 through 24. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus beholding him loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that, saying, and he went away and grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? So, as I was studying these scriptures, some words kind of stood out to me. So, starting with verse 17, I noticed that the rich man said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He didn't say, because he personalized the question, like rather than asking what should all men do, what should disciples do? And as we go forward, I feel that Christ answered him in a very personal way. Um, then Jesus beholding him. Loved him. And I remember this phrase being pointed out. 
somewhere in, in a previous lesson to me that when he beheld him, it means he knew him. He knew him so well, and he knows each one of us so well and loves us so much that he knows exactly what is required of each individual to help us reach our, our full potential. And that he knew that the one thing standing between this particular young man and his wholehearted commitment to God was his worldly possessions. So I feel like we each have something personally that's coming between us and Heavenly Father. Um, and my definition of love is when you want someone to reach their full potential, whatever that means. Um, so in verse 24, he says, how hard it is for them that trust in riches, in riches to enter the kingdom of God. So to me, this is saying the problem isn't the riches themselves. It's the fact that he's trusting in them. And he's not trusting in the atonement or in Christ. Um, we may or may not have many possessions. And as far as we do not neglect the poor and we pay our tithing, I believe we will be given the amount that is best for our highest and best good. Um, I do not believe the possessions were ever really the issue. As I said, um, he wants us to offer him our whole souls. So I actually wrote a quote that I thought kind of fit this. And it goes, um, man gave us money. God gave us time. Man will ask you, what did you do with your money? But God will ask you, what did you do with your time? Good morning, brothers and sisters. We need to put them in the Savior. So I felt like when you really look at the words, that's when it starts to make a little bit more sense. Um, he wants us to offer him our whole souls. So I wrote a quote once and I just thought it kind of made sense for this. It goes, man gave us money, God gave us time. Man will ask you, what did you do with your money? But God will ask you, what did you do with your time? And another quote by C.S. Lewis that stuck out to me as well. He says, Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent, as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. So that's C.S. Lewis uh, from the book Mere Christianity. So when I read this quote, this other quote popped into my head. And so I had to share this as well. And this is also by C.S. Lewis. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he is doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew those jobs needed doing, so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably <laughs> and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards, you thought you were being made, being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. So that just really reminded me of that, that he wants us to give him our whole selves so he can rebuild us. 
so he can dwell with us. Um, so an example I have of seeing someone um, not be concerned with material things and put Heavenly Father first is actually my husband, Dan, because he, when, I, when we got married, he made it clear that we were going to be paying our tithing first. And I had struggled with tithing in the past. And I remember when I went for my temple interview and the bishop said, you know, are you a current tithe payer? And at the time, I had not been doing it. And I said, no, I'm not. And he goes, well, you can be right now. You can make a decision right now that you are. And I was like, then I am. And from that time forward, I was. But when I met Dan, and he made it clear too, this is important in our family, I was just, I really respected that. And I saw that he was putting Heavenly Father first. Even when it's a scary month and you're not sure, you know, what's gonna happen, right? But um, I've always, Heavenly Father's always gotten us through. Um, my personal experience that I have of being born of God is my personal connection and affinity for Alma the Younger. When I was younger, I mean, I love Nephi, but I remember he like he was my hero, you know, and that was my favorite scripture I will go and do, and that's beautiful. Um, but as I experienced life and I went through some of the things that I've been through, and a lot of you know, but yes, I am a recovered meth addict who's been clean over 12 years. I was homeless. And Heavenly Father healed me when I came back to church and he turned my life around. So I really connect with Alma the Younger. Um, and so I'm going to read my favorite scripture from Alma the Younger. It is Alma 36, 12 through 21. But I was racked with eternal torment, for my soul was harrowed up to the greatest degree and racked with all my sins. Yea, I did remember all my sins and iniquities, for which I was tormented with the pains of hell. Yea, I saw that I had rebelled against my God, and that I had not only kept his holy, but I had not kept his holy commandments. Yea, I had murdered many of his children, or led them away unto destruction. Yea, and in fine so great had been my iniquities, that the very thought of coming into the presence of my God did rack my soul with inexpressible horror. And I'll move forward because he talks a lot about being tormented and how much that hurts. If it weren't for the atonement, we I would not be able to bear the things that I've witnessed and done in my life. And I'm so grateful that I don't have to bear that. And this is the part where he says, As my mind caught hold upon this thought, I cried within my heart, O oh, Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy on me, who am in the gall of bitterness, and am circled about by the everlasting chains of death. And now behold, when I thought this, I could remember my pains no more. I was harrowed up by the memory of my sins no more. And oh, what joy and what marvelous light did I behold. Yea, my soul was filled with joy as exceeding as was my pain. Yea, my son, that there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter as were my pains. Yea, again I say unto you, my son, that on the other hand, there could be nothing so exquisite and sweet as was my joy. So that, to me, shows what is being born of God. It's becoming a new creature. God can change us into a new creature and one who has no desire to sin. And you may ask, you know, what shall I gain by all of this? If I give my whole self to Heavenly Father, if I give everything up, what do I have to gain? And so we will look at Matthew 16 through 24. And then Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And what 
is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So we shall gain our soul. First of all, I think that's pretty good. Um, but there's more. We will gain the love of Christ and the love of God. We already have his love. Let me just say he loves us as we are right now. And we don't need to earn that love. But we shall also gain unity. Um, 4 Nephi 1, 15 through 17 came to pass there was no contention in the land because the love of God did dwell in the hearts of the people. So God loves us, but they had the love of God in their hearts. They were carrying it with them, and it was with the people. There was no envyings, no strifes, no tumults, no lines, no murderers, no robbers, no manner of ites. Okay? They were one. And as I said, as I was participating in the fast today, I thought, that's what we need. We need unity right now. And these people who had the love of God, they were unified. They didn't have these wars going on. So I think this is what the world really needs. We shall gain happiness. Um, we shall gain eternal life. So in President Holland's talk, he said that's like the key, the main thing, eternal life. Pretty exciting. Um, another thing to be gained, according to Elder Holland, is through learning to love God, we will gain the capacity and will to love our neighbors and ourselves. And I immediately thought of my friend, Sister Diamond, because she has a beautiful thought about why does God command us to love him? I might butcher it, I'm sorry. Um, that he doesn't need our love. He doesn't need us. You know, he's all powerful. He doesn't need us to love him. But that he knew if we could learn to love him, we would love ourselves and we would have the will and capacity to love our neighbors and ourselves the way we should by learning to love him. I hope I didn't destroy it. Um, so how can we live a higher and holier life? I think that's kind of the question brought up in this talk. Um, what is standing between me and giving my whole heart and soul to the Savior and God. And I think that's what the whole thing is about. You know, the possessions was what was in the way. What is in the way for each of us? We each have something that maybe we're holding on to that is getting between us and Heavenly Father. It could be anger, it could be pride, it could be, it doesn't have to be possessions, right? It could be something in our heart. Um, And I have one more quote uh, by Bishop Curry. Someday after mastering the winds, the waves, the tides, and gravity, we shall harness for God the energies of love. And then for a second time in the history of the world, man will have discovered fire. So I feel like if we could love Heavenly Father even close to the way he loves us, that the gravity of that would be as amazing as the first time man discovered fire. <clears throat> I bear my testimony that the Lord knows each one of us and he knows what's best for us individually. And I testify that young man with many possessions knew the right question. He didn't do the right thing, but he knew the right question, which is what shall I do? that I may inherit eternal life. I bear my testimony that if we ask this question, we will receive personal revelation as to what to do, maybe even discover our purpose and our mission for being here. We know our mission as a church, right? We know our mission as saints. We can look in the scriptures for that, but I also feel we each have an individual mission and an individual purpose and special talents why we're here. And maybe if you haven't received your patriarchal blessing yet, or that's something you're working towards, you can learn a little bit more about your individual callings. But we will learn whether we should go and what we should do. And I say these things in the name of our beloved Savior and our 
as their brother, Jesus Christ, amen.